What is going on, Meld Nation? Welcome back to the Dap Central YouTube channel. I'm your host here, Fareed, and as a part of today's video, I've got a long laundry list of updates surrounding the development of the Meld protocol. Now, if you guys are not aware, Ken Oling, who is the Meld CEO, recently had an AMA or an Ask Me Anything Twitter space hosted by Matt on Twitter. If you guys are not already following this team on Twitter, I highly recommend that you go ahead and do so. And I'm going to go ahead and leave their link to Twitter down in the description below. Now, as a part of this update, not only did they talk about their recent public testnet, which was just released, they also talked about their progress when it comes to C2F or crypto to fiat, the status of their EMI license, the bank manager NFTs, and their ongoing multi-chain operations. Now, what I want to do as a part of this video is briefly run through a laundry list of these topics, and then I'm going to turn you guys over to a recording so you guys can actually hear this information coming directly from Ken and Matt in real time. Now, before I jump into that, if it's your guys' first time stopping by the YouTube channel, my goal here is to provide you guys in the community with the latest news, tutorials, and reviews surrounding the top projects and builders on the network, which includes the Melt Protocol. That said, if you guys appreciate this type of content, please make sure to tap that like button. If it's your first time stopping by, consider subscribing. And if you have any questions for me, then make sure to leave those comments down below. I'm also a brand new single stake pool operator operating the official DAP Central stake pool, which has just crossed over. Over 2 million ADA and delegations, and we've just recently minted our very first block. If you guys want to support the channel, consider delegating with the stake pool ticker DAPP. That said, let's go ahead and jump straight into this laundry list, and I'm going to turn you guys over into the recording, which just took place yesterday on March 8th of 2023. So, the first thing I'm going to start off with is going to be the testnet and its updates and its recent progress. So, they first kick things off by highlighting the fact that they will not be releasing 500 testnet codes per day for users looking to gain access to the public testnet. Now, two days ago, they did make an announcement basically highlighting the fact that they would be onboarding 100 users per week, but that has been bumped up to 500 users per week. Now, the reason why they're using codes in the first place is to prevent users from creating multiple accounts, given the fact that on the Mel testnet right now, there is an automated process or an automated faucet providing users on the platform with tokens. So if they didn't have this gate on, um, we could potentially see people jumping onto the testnet, creating multiple wallets, therefore draining a lot of the assets from the faucet if they weren't actually using the platform as expected. Now, on, in terms of additional updates surrounding their testnet, Ken did confirm that all Melt smart contracts have been deployed and they're actively working on their liquidation bot. They're also performing security and load testing. And one cool thing that was mentioned here as a part of the testnet integration was the support for JED. If you guys are not familiar with JET, this is going to be a brand new over collateralized algorithmic stablecoin that just landed on Cardano at the beginning of February. That said, we've seen JET gain over more than $12 million locked on Cardano. And what the Mel team is looking to do now is add this particular um, token to their testnet. Now, they've already got IUSD, which is going to be a synthetic representation of a US dollar from the Indigo protocol incorporated into their testnet. On top of that, they're going to be closely working with DEXs, which include wing riders and the MinSwap platform in order to optimize the liquidation process. Now, following the updates on the testnet, they briefly switch gears and talk a little bit about the impacts of Celsius and the recent FTX fallout. In summary, they basically talked about custodial risks, mismanagement of funds, and their impacts within the broader and crypto space. After that, they talked a little bit about their genius loan, which will be a self-repaying loan feature coming from Meld. And what Ken basically mentioned here is that this particular feature is still on track and it's going to be built using the existing smart contracts with a specific configuration. On top of that, we should be seeing the introduction of the Genius Loans on the testnet within the next 30 to 60 days. So if you guys have been waiting patiently for this particular tool, make sure to sign up for the testnet so you guys can get access to it as soon as it's released. After that, they talked about their multi-chain operation and some of the progress that they've made on that front. Now, if you guys are not aware, other DeFi protocols, including Aave, are now also going multi-chain. Aave is going to be a lending and borrowing protocol operating on 
the Ethereum network, which is going to be an EVM compatible chain. And they're going to be migrating or incorporating the Polygon and BSC networks as well. So it does look like Meld is going to be taking a similar stance. If you guys are not aware, Meld will be building natively on Cardano, but they will be also launching their own Meld subnet or sidechain. And they're also going to be supported on a few other blockchains. Now, as a part of this update here, can confirm that Melt successfully connected a MetaMask wallet to their own testnet or sidechain on the AVAX platform. So this is not actually running um, as an AVAX protocol, but it's running using the Avalanche subnet feature. So I want to make that clear. This is going to be a sidechain very similar to what we're seeing with the World Mobile Token and their AYA sidechain or their AYA um, network being built using the S, uh, Cosmos SDK. Now, this new Melt sidechain, as I mentioned, will run as a subnet on Avalanche, and the tokenomics have been finalized for this new sidechain as well. Ken briefly also touched on the transaction throughput, which he mentioned right now is currently at 2,000 transactions per second on this sidechain. So that's going to greatly outweigh what we're seeing right now on Cardano without Hydra. But hopefully as we begin to get more layer two scaling solutions on Cardano, we'll begin to see these numbers increase as well. Now, after they talked about the transaction throughput, they actually talked about the transaction cost. And so Ken stated that transaction cost on the official meld sidechain came out to one penny when the actual value of the Mel token was $20. If you guys are not aware, the Mel token right now is trading at about a penny and a half. And so it's got a quite a long ways to go until it hits $20. Therefore, basically stating indirectly that the um, side chain transaction fees are quite negligible until the actual value of the Mel token increases dramatically. So again, a lot of really good news um, surrounding the transaction throughput and transaction cost when it comes to using the brand new Meld sidechain. Now, in terms of adoption, they did also mention that this Meld token, right, which is going to be the native token for this protocol, will be made available on Ethereum, Polygon, Cardano, the Meld sidechain, the Avalanche network. And then after that, they're going to be aiming to target the Binance Smart Chain and ZK Sync. He also mentioned that the token contracts will be deployed on all of these different chains and that all of these tokens or all of these networks will be supporting the official native meld token. So they're not going to be wrapping assets or providing W meld or anything like that. Like we currently see, for example, with Bitcoin coming onto Ethereum where it's wrapped and unwrapped. So a lot of really solid news and positive news there. And in closing, they did also mention that on the side chain that the um, node operators will be able to uh, basically earn meld rewards and that all of the transactions fees will be paid using meld on the side chain. Now, following that, Ken did also talk about bridging solutions, which he mentioned that they're going to be using or collaborating the multi-chain platform. Now, multi-chain is going to be a bridging platform, um, bridging across a lot of different ecosystems within the crypto space. And as a part of the 25 days of Meld, which took place during the month of December, we saw Meld officially partner with the multi-chain app. Now with that, what we are going to be able to see is that the minting and burning mechanisms will actually not be occurring on the bridge itself. If you guys are not familiar with how minting and burning works, normally this is done on the actual bridges themselves. But over the course of the last few years, we've seen that that has become a um, soft point or a point of contention when it comes to exploits. And so hackers and um, people that are looking to take advantage of liquidity on bridges know to actually target the bridges themselves. And so knowing that Meld is actually going to be using the Meld DAO or the Decentralized Autonomous Organization with a multi-sig wallet. And if you guys are not familiar with what a multi-sig wallet is, it's basically a wallet that requires multiple inputs or multiple signatures from different parties for a transaction to be confirmed. So Meld, uh, the Meld DAO will actually be managing all of the funds and all of the minting and burning occurring for the token across all of the supported chains. Now that said, don't worry, the Meld tokenomics will remain the same with a total of 4 billion tokens. The team has been adamant in stating that they're not going to be adding any new additional supply, therefore potentially deflating or excuse me, um, decreasing the existing value of any tokens that may already be in circulation. 
Very lastly, Ken highlighted a brand new concept that I personally had not heard about, and this was the insurance um, of the actual bridging platforms or the bridging transactions taking place. So in summary, he basically mentioned that they're working with a partner right now, and this has not been finalized just yet, but this will basically allow for any transactions which occur through the multi-chain bridge to be insured. And again, this would basically come into play or into effect in case there was an exploit and you would have uh, bridged assets into a separate ecosystem or a separate network. Moving right along, they also talked about the bank manager NFTs in which they confirmed that the vending machine and the website should be ready by the end of the month of March. The NFT should be available on the test net within the next two weeks, and the NFTs will be made available on the main net um, following their thorough testing on the test net for about two to three months. Now, this two to three month minting window will be adjusted if the number of uh, NFTs have not been claimed. And again, keep in mind that there's going to be a total of 42,000 of these NFTs available for claiming. If you delegated to the Melt ISPO for at least one epoch, you will be eligible to claim this as long as you use the same exact wallet that you use to delegate during their ISPO. In closing on the bank managers, Ken confirmed that any leftover NFTs will be used by the marketing team for different campaigns in the near future. After that, they talked about the Melt app in which they gave us some status updates and confirmed that they're finalizing all of the smart contracts for the Melt app and that all of the core features and functionality have now been ironed out. The team is also working on quality of life features and adding new actions into the Melt wallet. Following that, he also highlighted the fact that the team is working on supporting or adding support for new blockchains and that the wallet is going to be set to be released on the mainnet in May. Now, this marks the first ever time that the Mel team has announced any kind of mainnet date. And in the past, what they basically stated is that they only want to talk about the mainnet once things have been ironed out on the test net. And so do keep in mind that while they did mention that this will be launching in, in May, if there's any black swan events or any big issues that pop up between now and then, we could potentially see this being delayed. Now, the smart contracts when it comes to this launch here on Cardano are going to be audited by the Vacuum Labs team, which is a pretty reputable team in the Cardano ecosystem. Now, they're going to be verifying the lending and borrowing smart contracts, as well as all of the smart contracts surrounding the Meld app wallet. When it comes to the EVM side of things, that audit is going to be taking place by Certic, which is also a reputable uh, platform on the EVM side of contracts. And they're going to be verifying the smart contracts surrounding the Melt token and the Melt wallet. Now, moving right along, I want to talk a little bit about the EMI license and their crypto to fiat updates that were mentioned as a part of this update. So it says here that the team has now implemented a tech stack for the implementation of their C2F services. And then on top of that, the team is now working on a mobile development platform or the mobile development, I should say, of the Android and iOS applications. Now, there are no issues in close sight for the Android application. However, we did recently see that the Uniswap application was banned from the Apple iOS store for at least one year due to the fact that it supports crypto. That said, the Mel team is a little hesitant into putting any more time developing a iOS native app due to this concern. And so we will have to wait a little bit to kind of see exactly how that plays out. Um, but it does look like on Android, there shouldn't be any new issues. On top of that, there's now an internal team dedicated to regulations and compliance for the C2F efforts with their smart contracts for C2F being currently built and tested internally. Now, in closing here for the, for the C2F updates, in May, the Mel team will be onboarding or begin the onboarding process for private banks and business customers. So get ready. Looks like 2023 will be the year for Meld that we've all been waiting for. Now, following all of those updates, they switched gears and went into the community Q&A section. As a part of this year, I'm not going to dive into all of the questions, but again, feel free to use the timestamps down in the description below to kind of jump around. They talked about being a Melt node operator. Now, Ken confirmed that being a Melt node operator or operating a Melt node on their side chain, which again is running as a subnet on top of the Avalanche network, will require a pledge of 2000 AVAX. Now, at the time of shooting this video, that comes out to somewhere around 30 or so thousand dollars. Um, but that's going to be operating in a very similar way that we're seeing pledges being used on Cardano. Now, on Cardano, there is no minimum pledge, but on AVAX, there is a 2000 AVAX minimum pledge. 
Now, the team is also actively working with a service provider to be able to spin up va validators and then fractionalize them to operators, making the entry cost a little bit cheaper. And so in this method, Melt will literally be fronting the 2000 AVAX, getting the uh, node operator or getting the node running, and then they'll be fractionali fractionalizing that node out to all the operators looking to actually operate on the Melt node, therefore reducing the entry price into becoming an actual node operator. Now, Meld will clarify exactly how much AVAX will be needed by operators if an agreement is made with this particular service provider. But worst case scenario, brace yourselves, you guys, if you do want to be an operator and get that 2000 AVAX ready. Now, right now, they've currently got three active Meld validators, and they're going to need at least nine of those in order to actually launch their subnet. So again, they're going to be needing at least six brand new node validators to help them run their Meld sidechain operating on the AVAX network. Now, I'm going to briefly run through the remaining Q&A um, topics that were discussed, which include the Meld protocol rewards, the bank manager NFT minting for diamond hand holders, data oracles on Cardano. They also gave updates on the gold back token, as well as node operator rewards operating on the melt sidechain and then in closing they talked about the integration of the lace wallet in which ken basically said that the lace wallet appears to have some of the strongest security that he's seen compared to all the other wallets developed on cardano if you don't know what the lace wallet is this is going to be a brand new wallet developed specifically by iog which is also driving the core development behind cardano and then in closing, they talked about crypto community events in which the Mel team said that they're not going to be attending a lot of the bigger events right now until they've got a product to deliver. And then they wrapped up by talking about the future utility of the meld token so again as i promised that was quite the list and if you guys want to find out or skip to specific portions of this ama then please make sure to use the time stamps down in the description below if you guys found this update here to be helpful i would really really appreciate it if you guys could tap that like button it does go a long way given that i'm a single content creator if it's your first time stopping by consider subscribing for more news like this surrounding meld and cardano in general and if you guys have any questions for me about Meld or Cardano, then make sure to leave those down in the comment section below. That said, make sure to stay in tune with Meld. And at this time, I'm going to turn it over to you guys into the AMA recording. I hope you guys enjoy. Oh, nice Meld app update. I'm sure some of you here in the space have been using the testnet, enjoying shaking it down in alpha, and now the public beta. Or I think we're distributing about, I think last time Victor updated it, to 600 codes a week? 500, 500 uh -huh. codes uh, a day, not a week. Okay, so we did finally sell on that, okay. Yeah, 500 codes a day. So the goal, the when we did it to 100, it wasn't to keep anybody out. It was just simply we didn't expect to get 500 per day. Um, and since we did, then we just upped it to, to much higher. So um, no, the idea here is not to gate it anymore. The idea here is just that because when you when you use the code and you get into the to the testnet app you're automatically airdropped a whole bunch of testnet tokens from our faucet so under a normal testnet you would sort of just go into the testnet then you would have to go to a separate place to get a faucet and you'd have to do a whole bunch of different faucets to get different types of of test tokens and it's just a general pain in the neck um, so we decided to do this airdrop and make it super easy for you to get a whole bunch of different tokens the the trade-off for that is that if someone games the system and they just go in and there's no there's no code uh someone can game the system go in and just drain the the faucet from all the test tokens and then nobody has them except for a bunch of uh dead wallets so that's the reason why the code is there it's not there to sort of block anybody from actually getting in yeah initially the um for having the closed beta, it's just so, you know, getting through some some of the more glaring UI issues. Because, I mean, it's it's an alpha product, right? So we don't want people assuming it's just like right on the verge of, you know, open and mainnet when you have something that's an alpha, right? And so a lot of people don't understand or care to understand these distinctions very much. So we made sure we had a bunch of, we had a bunch of people who, who through applying to the process, we made sure they, were, they had an experience with testing or diligent, and some who weren't. You know, you want a variety, but that everybody understood, like, what the conditions were and the parameters were of the alpha. And now that a lot of the stuff there have been taken care of by some very, by the initial 500 people who were very good at what they're doing, 
we're now opening it up and so the user experience is much better also ken we can hear you breathing sorry guys i'll put myself on mute <laughs> Yeah. But uh, yeah, so now we're opening it up. And like we say, the gating is just purely to stop some malfeasance from going in and trying to make a bunch of spoof accounts and draining all the test data and stuff like that, right? So it's basically just a measure. And I mean, the fact you moved it from like 500 a week to 500 a day, it shows that, you know, we're victims of our own success. Uh, I put the term victim very loosely. So it's good problems to have. It seems a lot of people want to try it out and helps push the system to its paces. Because now in this phase, we, we can do things that we weren't quite able to in the others which is really start to put the you know, do stress and duress tests right so we're moving on to the next phase that that involves uh you know the, the kind of stuff that blockchains really get tested on their metal which is you know distributed computing and concurrency so things like that so without further ado um with that sort of housekeeping out of the way i guess we'll throw it to ken and ask what's our how's our dev progress on cardano here we know we're in test net but is a, do we have um possible dates for mainnet live so yeah, so <clears throat> all of the smart contracts have been deployed. Um, everything is operational and working. So lending and borrowing, and you know, everything connected to that with all the different tokens. Um, what we're testing and working on right now are liquidation bots. So we have a liquidation bot and we're doing some work on that to make that liquidation bot a bit more user-friendly. What that basically means is when you do a liquidation, you have to, or you would traditionally, you would have to calculate a lot of uh, variables. Um, so how many tokens are you actually supplying? Um, what are the prices for these different things? You have to go through a lot of calculations in order to sort of feed the bot with the right numbers when it does the liquidation. Uh, so in the version two of the bot that we've just launched, I guess about a week and a half ago, um, we're in the process of trying to put all of those calculations on the back end. Um, so the bot gets them from the smart contracts or it gets them from the blockchain <clears throat> so that there's no chances of the person working on the bot um, to make some you know, bad math and then end up getting wrecked as a result of it or not being able to get the liquidation or whatever the, the situation might be. So it's a kind of quality of life um, adjustments to the bot so that we can get the bot working really well and we can run several of these different bots. So there's that side. Secondly, um, we're working on the actual sort of live operational smart contracts and we're doing refactoring, uh, making some modifications to them to make them a bit more efficient, these types of things. And then finally, <clears throat> like you said, Matt, we're doing stress testing and we're doing sort of security analysis, looking at different attack vectors on it. Um, a lending and borrowing protocol is fundamentally different than many other types of protocols. And the way it is different is that for it to operate efficiently or operate safely, it operates in concert with other protocols. So it is, you know, I've said from the beginning, this is all about composability. And it's very true in a lending and borrowing protocol because if someone wants to go and, you know, liquidate a position, they will pay back the collateral. Sorry, they'll pay back the loan. They'll get the collateral. They'll take it to a DEX. They'll convert that into a stable coin, typically, or convert it into some other more liquid asset like ADA. And in Ethereum, that is done in one or two transactions. So it's done very, very fast. Um, we do it in, uh, we have to do it in a couple more transactions because UTXO is a bit different, but we're still trying to do it in as few transactions as we can. And we're trying to figure out exactly how to make that process as fast and as efficient as possible. Why is that of any relevance? Because in a financial system, time is one of the criteria. So you have price and you have time. And those are critical components. So if the, the, the nature of your transaction is going to be different, if it or the risk in your transaction is going to be different, if it takes for you to do all those transactions in one minute, or it takes all of those transactions to do in 30 minutes. 
that's a major difference um, and it's a major risk that has to be calculated into the system. So when we calculate the borrowability and the liquidation on all of the supported tokens, and I'll talk a little bit about supported tokens in a little while, um, one of the factors we take in consideration is how long it's taking for a transaction to go through on the blockchain right now. That is a criteria. And so we're looking at all of these different security points. Um, they're not particularly relevant to meld per se as a whole, but they're exceedingly relevant to all of the users. Because if a user wants to go and liquidate something and they go through that process, but it takes so long that by the time they get the collateral back to the decks and they convert it, the price has gone less than what they've actually did the liquidation for, they end up losing money. And that is a that is an an absolutely untenable position. It's an unacceptable position for me. So <clears throat> we're taking the contracts, we're making them more efficient, we're working on the liquidation bot, um, and on the front end, we're doing small sort of uh, quality of life um, adjustments in relationship to the Cardano part of the the lending and borrowing and the cardano part of the wallet yeah to sort of paraphrase what ken said there is that normally dexes don't have to worry like the a big distinction between dexes and borrowing lending protocols is, of course similarities that they convert assets right you know you swap but the, the big difference is that dexes typically don't handle liquidations and the issue with liquidations is that they have i like to call temporal sensitivity in that how fast they react to things is important because, as Ken was saying, that you don't want to run into a situation where, of course, you know, there's all of a sudden there's a massive, the, the market decides to take a dump. There's a massive change in asset prices. And all of a sudden, global, global outstanding collateral is lower than global outstanding loans. And what that's called is a GSC, a global shortfall event, which is very bad for a protocol. It means essentially, people are incentivized to just walk away, right, with the, the borrower. So that's not something you ever want to have happen. And so you want to make sure that the protocol and the oracles are all keeping up a lockstep and updating the prices as quickly as possible. Because when the prices aren't updated as quickly as the true price of the asset, you get that incongruence, which leads to a shortfall event. So that's the that's a difficulty of trying to engineer a borrowing lending protocol that otherwise DEXs usually don't have to contend with. That's why it's been easier to bring in the market as opposed to borrowing lending. For those who might not understand the difficulties in the engineering behind it and why things would take a little bit longer. You have a few more boxes to tick to make sure that they're all running very smoothly. So that's that's generally, as Ken is saying, been the number one priority. So moving on to, I suppose, uh, we'll go through some of the Avalanche stuff too. Uh, I think we can we sort of go through the motions of that. Okay, our partners actually, and then maybe we'll jump to Avalanche. So whichever direction you want to go with that one. You want to discuss partner first? Yeah, yeah. So <clears throat> I want to talk about, you know, we're talking about being part of a DeFi ecosystem so the partners are relevant. Um, so we have a lot of different people that are working with us in collaboration on the on the testnet. So we have uh, MinSwap, we have uh, Wing Riders, uh, we have Hosky, we have, yeah, lots of different partners. Um we have IUSD, we're bringing on Jed now. So we've had several meetings with them to bring them onto the test net. Um, and we're trying to sort of talk, we're working with Charlie 3, we're trying to talk with <clears throat> as many of the protocols or projects on Cardano as possible that have a reasonable amount of liquidity in the DEXs. Um, and so it's important that we have these partnerships with regards to MinSwap and Wing Riders. We're not only just supporting their token and allowing it to be lent and borrowed, but we're actually working closely with them on the testnet side um, and getting access to their testnet DEXs so that we can test these, um, these transactions that go through the process of liquidating and then converting assets to something else. Um, <clears throat> and so we find that you know, these, these real world tests are very, very telling and they're going to be, we're, we're going to publish a lot of material in relationship to this and we'll have a live dashboard for it. But, you know, we have things like when we go through this process and we do some of these tests with these tokens, 
in order for a token to go through, you're looking at, you know, eight or 9% uh, slippage. And so these are the kinds of things that we have to test thoroughly, that we have to, you know, really understand very well, that we have to publish um, to make sure everybody understands this, that we have to sort of talk to the DEXs and work with the partners around this in order to make sure that, you know, that we're not putting ourselves into a position where the users are going to be at risk. Um, so it's been great. We've learned an enormous amount. Um, and right now, some of the bigger issues, we're, we're working directly with IOG um, and lots of other projects uh, that are kind of high volume. So we're talking with drip drops in regards to this because they're, um, they do a lot of kind of high performance transactions um, when they're sort of using their network and they're doing distributions. Um, so the partners are sort of really critical in this ecosystem uh, because effectively what we're talking about is, you know, the, the, the genesis of the DeFi ecosystem in Cardano. When you bring all these pieces together and you can start to orchestrate them as a sort of, of a, as a single market, as a money market. Yeah, it's uh, like we say, like with the having Texas are an integral part of like this whole thing, and so especially in liquidation. So we have to make sure we're on point with uh, all our different partners. It's been a very illuminating process in you know, talking with uh, each different partner, uh, their APIs, and uh, just knowing a little bit more about the tech under the hood. You know, it's it's like Kim was saying, it's it Cardano tends to be a very interconnected kind of uh, uh, ecosystem. Uh, and yeah, have you learned anything about the Celsius bankruptcy? Well, what kind of, you know, that happened just on the heels of uh, of uh, consensus, you know, the the big event in all of crypto. And so there's a lot to talk about post uh, consensus in Austin. And I think yeah. if anything, on long term, it's a boon to DeFi because Celsius is uh, what we sort of derisively call, you know, CDFI, which is really just uh, degenning on other decentralized platforms and having like a, a centralized intermediary with Celsius, except that it worked kind of like it was the worst of both worlds. You know, you have like the, the intermediary that in terms of the terms of service, you're the last one in line to get back your own assets when it turns out that Celsius didn't manage your assets very well. Yeah. So this was from someone in the telegram group <clears throat> asked this question and, the the generally the uh, outside of FTX, although even FTX supported us um, tremendously as well, um, it's been fantastic. I'm super super happy at all these bankruptcies. You know, at the beginning of 2022, when we started the year, we had six competitors. So we had um, Celsius, we had Vault, we had Genesis, we had BlockFi, uh, we had Voyager. Um, and Nexo um, founders got raided by uh, Bulgarian authorities. Uh, yeah, and all of them are gone now. So the the whole kind of you know with first with the, sort of the the mismanagement of funds in general or mismanagement of debt in general with these C fi projects where their oversight is only organized around annual reports or annual sort of audits, not on a sort of day by day or week by week basis, then they're getting into these very, very risky situations because they can afford to. And when the same thing happened with FTX, obviously on a much grander scale and a much more bombastic scale, but that also helped kind of tip the scales. It was kind of the last, the last sort of straw for a lot of the different protocols um, these C5 protocols and sort of it kicked, you know, Genesis, uh, which was one of the big institutional ones, one of the last the, in sort of over the edge. So I think that all these bankruptcies and failures, they suck because they generate a huge amount of FUD in the market. They, um, what would you call it? They misrepresent crypto, uh, which is the bad thing. So when, when you see regulators, regulators are trying to regulate against CFI. Um, the challenge here is that, you know, CFI was already regulated. And so their response is not to do some sort of special regulation for CFI because that would have a direct impact on the entire financial ecosystem. 
they in instead of they leave that alone but they go after the DeFi side of things and so that's a bit of an unfortunate thing that we're going to have to sort of do a lot of education on but in general all these bankruptcies we consider them to be fantastic for our business model and our offering yeah i think what it was is essentially as we saw the dominoes start to fall and uh, the great unwinding ning happening you know throughout the system as the contagion spread was that each each of these was just like again a reminder uh, a marquee reminder of custodial risk and how they were a front to bedrock principles of of crypto and DeFi is that the whole point is to do away with custodial risk or rather you are your own custodian and so what each one of these examples remind us of is that you don't really you're not really aware of who's in line to be claim assets until your assets are locked up with a custodian that is filing for chapter 11 and then you start to un- yet see the unfortunate side of the legal end of things in an end user license agreement so that's uh, unfortunately we had to learn those lessons in the most dramatic way but i think a lot of people were again reminded of you know why why crypto is based uh, around the fundamentals as it is so it's it's unfortunate but i think in the long term it's a boon to uh, decentralization all right so let's get on to the status of the self paying loan otherwise known as the genius loan this is one of the most important features that we've been advertising and was one of the uh, bedrock or keystone elements of the white paper yeah so i mean Nothing has changed in regards to the Genius Loan. Um, it's still in there. It's still in there for Cardano. It's still in there for any other um, lending and borrowing protocol we launch. Um, so it's it really, it's a kind of, a, it's a byproduct or it's effectively some adjustments to some parameters in the supplying and borrowing mechanics. Um, so once we have general lending and borrowing up and running and working correctly, um, then it's a matter of modifying some of those values in order for the genius loan to operate efficiently. And so it is on track. Uh, it will definitely be there. Um, we'll, you'll probably be seeing it in the next maybe month or month and a half in the test net, and you'll be able to start to, to play with this and see how it works. Uh, with uh, some of the other thing priorities that were imminent about just getting the testnet up and running and making sure you know uh, at least as far as uh, alpha versions considered mvp was there you know but this is definitely something that logically follows suit once you've got everything in place once you got all your other ducks lined up right so once the big ticket priorities are taken care of then you can you can start to expand out the feature set when you've got the fundamentals taken care of here on the uh on my app here i'm fat fingering it a bit uh do we want to move to start talking about uh, the interrelationship between going multi-chain sure thanks because you know people know that we're also launching on avalanche and it seems like the general life cycle of a lot of a lot of end game for most part borrowing lending protocols they want to expose their services to as many people as possible and really we're no different because ave is multi-chain the most eminent storied player in the DeFi space, right? You know, they migrating to Uniswap, uh, or sorry, so they they had a community vote to migrate to Polygon. A lot of DeFi is now being done mostly on rollups like Optimism and Arbitrum, and then Aave also uh, having plans to deploy on BSC as well. These services want to be able to reach as many as possible, and we're no different in that regard. And so when outside of um, Cardano, where was the next logical place? And we settled on Avalanche, as many people know. So uh, there's a few things that people ask about. Uh, for one, uh, how many chains will support? Um, how does the bridging work? Um, how does it work across the chains and so on and so forth? So I think we'll just go through those in turn, I suppose. So. So yeah, <clears throat> when it comes to multi-chain, um, I'll start with the meld side chain. Um, I can <clears throat> give you guys some really good news. We we um, connected the the internal test net for the meld blockchain to MetaMask last night, um, and internally we're been, we've been sending 
meld tokens to one another and doing transactions. Um, <clears throat> I can tell you that we've finalized the tokenomics on the meld blockchain. Uh, there's two sort of key criteria that I can give you or key sort of indicators that I can give you. Um, first, the um, transaction throughput is 2,000 transactions per second. So that's the one of the sort of KPIs connected to it. And transaction-wise, for a native token to native token transaction, uh, the cost in gas is um, one cent when the meld token is $20. So if the meld token ever got to $20, then the gas fee for that transaction will be one cent. So there's a couple of, of points to bring up here. Um, that fee is when there's not congestion on the network. So because um, you need to have preventative measures for DDoS attacks, um, as the network becomes congested, those fees go up. And just to backtrack it just a little bit to clarify that, again, this is on Avalanche, where the smart contract platform is EVM. So gas fees are a thing, whereas on Cardano, they're not, right? No, this is not on Avalanche. So oh, this right. is on the MELD blockchain. Okay. So this is on, we have our own native blockchain. <clears throat> the coin is MELD. MELD will be tradable and sort of usable on Avalanche, um, but it's native on the MELD blockchain. So you're able to, on the MELD blockchain, you're able to pay gas fees in MELD. When you run a stake pool, you get paid you know, block rewards in MELD. So you can think of it more along the lines of a sidechain, similar to what... Um, what World Mobile is doing, where they're running a, a side chain on Cosmos. Um, we're running our own side chain, uh, but it's a native side chain. Um, but we're using the underlying sort of technical and consensus infrastructure from Avalanche. But the chain itself, it is a native meld chain. It's not the Avalanche chain. So with regards to the meld token, the meld token will be native on i think it's five blockchains when we launch so it'll be native on ethereum polygon cardano um, meld avalanche and then soon after that we will make it native on um, bsc and zk sync so those are the the plans right now um, and when I say native, I mean that it will just be meld. So it's not wrapped meld or meld.e or any of these kind of weird abominations. It's just meld. Um, and so we'll have smart contracts or token contracts on all of these blockchains. And so that kind of leads me to the next point, which is um, our current bridge partner is multi-chain. Uh, so they're the largest bridge provider, bridge uh, sort of token bridging company. Uh, protocol in the space uh, by um, TBL. And we're partnering up with them to be able to bridge not only the MELD token, but lots of other, almost any kind of token um, across to multiple different blockchains. And so you'll be able to bridge, um, yeah, you'll be able to bridge the MELD token to any of the blockchains. And the way that this works is um, it's a bit similar to the way that something like a USDC works in that there is a mint and burn mechanic, but it's not a mint and burn mechanic on the bridge itself, right? So there are lots of different attack vectors um, in bridges. <clears throat> and one of the most dangerous attack vector is to provide uh, smart contracts on the bridge that actually mint and burn on the bridge. So you sort of bring your token to the bridge and the bridge itself burns the token and mints it on a different blockchain. We are not doing that. So the way our mint and burn works is we effectively provide liquidity across multiple blockchains. And then if let's say, for example, somebody wants to um, take their MELD token and bridge it from uh, Cardano to Polygon. 
So we will provide liquidity on Polygon. And then when you bring your asset to the bridge on the Cardano side, it gets locked up. And then the, the liquidity that we provided on the Polygon side is sent to your wallet on Polygon. And then the token that was on the Cardano side becomes the property of MELD. So we facilitate the bridging process, but we do not expose the, the mint and burn on the bridge action itself. So the way that the mint and burn works is the DAO, the, the MELD DAO, will look at all the different blockchains on a regular basis and will do adjustments on the supply as a whole. So if we see that a lot of tokens are moving from Ethereum to Cardano, then we will provide more liquidity on Ethereum, or sorry, on Cardano, um, and we'll burn tokens on the Ethereum side. So the way that we do that is through a multi-sig. So the DAO manages a multi-sig, and the DAO will then have a multi-sig of whatever, five out of seven, um, that is then able to burn on the Ethereum side and mint on the Cardano side. So this has a couple of benefits. One, uh, you're not exposing this minting and burn mechanic out to anywhere that can be attacked. And two, we're able to sort of facilitate large movements of, uh, of assets across these different blockchains. Um, so we think this is a very healthy way of going about it, at least for the foreseeable future, until people feel more comfortable um, with the sort of bridge-based minting and burning, but I think that's going to be a couple of years from now before before we see anything that that people feel comfortable with that. Um, so that's the basic premise of of how we're handling the 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 movement of tokens across all the different blockchains. Uh, additionally, users will be able to supply uh, meld tokens to the bridge, and they'll earn a yield against that. Um, in the same way that you do with other tokens on other bridges. So if I could just sort of try and reiterate if I've got this correct, um, instead of a traditional system, uh, the protocol itself, the meld protocol on its own chain sort of acts as a global ledger between all like the outstanding tokens. And it acts more of like the bridging max more as a transaction sent and received. So you don't have this kind of locked up because like the, the problem with traditional bridges is that when you have chain A and you're trying to bridge them over to chain B, what happens is chain A locks up the original assets on chain A and takes them out of circulation and sort of puts them in a box. And the only way you can unlock that box is when after the, you have those tokens that have been now created wholesale from from out of the basically out of nothing on chain B, with the understanding that the original ones on chain A never get out of their box. This is why you this is how you ensure that you don't have double spend, right? You're destroying. You're essentially taking it out of supply on one end and putting in and creating out of whole cloth into supply on the new end, right? The problem is though is that if that box ends up being unlocked on the original chain, then the ones they're essentially a wrap version on chain B functionally become worthless because now you've got you've essentially created two, two of the same thing and that's a problem right as long as that smart contract that is supposed to sequester and secure and take out circulation on chain a gets compromised the whole system falls apart whereas in this case it seems more like we're actually just sort of sending and receiving and sort of sending different wallets in a, in a way that functions a little bit differently so we don't have that is that is that a decent approximation or did i get that wrong no that's correct yeah and and on a, on a sort of related note, um, the there's across all blockchains, there will be a total of exactly four billion tokens at any given time. And this is an so, important distinction. Sorry, oh, sorry, there's a little bit of lag there. Sorry, continue. So so, <clears throat> so yeah, so the, you have four billion tokens, and the way that this is governed is we're able to look at an oracle. Um, and we're able to see this, um, and it's a very simple sort of calculation, right? So you add them all up and there's 4 billion or there's not 4 billion. If there's not 4 billion, then we pause and we sort it out. Um, but the, it's a, it's a, it, it might not be very fancy or very sophisticated, but I think that monetary systems like this, um, should be pretty easy to mentally sort of wrap your head around. So the 4 billion is static. It's always 4 billion. It's only 4 billion. That's just the way it is. Um, and that is across all blockchains. So the minting and burning 
to keep that at 4 billion is done by the DAO through a multi-sig and only right now that way. There we go. Uh, yeah, so that's basically how we want to manage uh, the movement of assets across uh, different uh, chains and to try and bring this protocol to as many people as possible. Uh, because, like I say, like the, the traditional mechanic is to wrap an asset and sort of sequester it. But, of course, that creates uh, the risk of a double spend. Whereas this, this system, we're trying to avoid that. Because, as we all know, like the, the number one source of DeFi hacks and 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 problems has been bridge protocols. The second place doesn't even come close. So naturally, there's a lot of trepidation after the Nomad hack, the wormhole hack, on and on. You know, there's there's de plenty of different examples, and so we're trying to get away from like those those previous those instances. There's always going to be risk, but it's a matter of of figuring out where that risk sits and who's responsible for that risk. So an example is we're talking to one company or one project. Um, that provides in transit uh, insurance for the tokens across the bridge. Uh, we haven't finalized anything yet. It's not sort of finished, or many, but it's a very, very intriguing idea that when you do a bridge, then you can just click a checkbox in the Meld wallet or the Meld app, and in the process of that token leaving your wallet and going into the other wallet on the other blockchain, um, there is a insurance that's happening there. Nice. Actually, we've got a question from the Discord. Um, a user wants to have an update on the EMI. And this is the EMI is the electronic uh, money institution. So yeah, that's that fine. Happen. We can do yeah. that, but let's let's do that after we've covered the the blockchain stuff. Okay. Like Meld okay. Mel, Mel app and other stuff like that. Okay. Uh, what do you want to cover next on that regard? Um, I think that, uh, let's see, what do I have in my notes here? Um, I guess we can talk about, um, we can talk about the um, bank manager NFTs. Yep. That's always a fun thing to talk about. Um, <laughs> So the bank manager NFTs, uh, we should have the vending machine uh, smart contracts and have the website all up and running and going by the end of the month. Uh, we'll probably be in testnet next week um, to te test it all out to make sure everything is working well. As soon as it's been tested, um, then we will launch it live and we'll probably keep it open for maybe two or three months um, to allow everybody who was part of the ISPO to be able to um, collect their bank manager NFT. So we're, we're, we're on the smart contract side of things now. Um, and we're getting it to its, uh, final state. Uh, people have asked as a follow-up on that, um, after the three month period, anyone, cause like essentially we airmarked, are we just going to lock it as as many people actually mint them in that three month period? So there's conceivably around 42,000 eligible wallets, but only the number eligible that manages to mint in that three month span that will eventually be the total number of bank manager nfts or after that three months we open up and any available ones up to that 40k limit can just be minted by anybody how are we approaching that no i think that i think we'll probably give out a bunch of bank manager nfts as part of sort of like marketing or something like that yeah. but i think the three months is just a kind of a a, a rule of thumb right now if we see that yeah. let's say at the three month mark only twenty thousand people have have collected their bank manager um, then we'll just keep it open. There's no, there's no reason for us to shut it down. We just expect three months to be a reasonable amount of time uh, mm -hmm. for pretty much everybody who is part of the ISPO to be able to come in and uh, be able to get their bank manager um, sent to their wallet. Yeah, and keep in mind it has to be sent to the wallet that was originally delegated or wallets that were delegated to the ISPO. So make sure you still have the, uh, the keys for those wallets. That's that's basically a, that's that's a must have. <laughs> so I guess going on to the to the Meld app, um, the Meld app is doing really well. Um, most of the core functionality for lending and borrowing and the wallet side of things have been ironed out. We're now working on more sort of quality of life stuff, graphs and charts, making things faster and smoother. Uh, we're now <clears throat> the way that the wallet is currently set up is 
on the left hand side you have all of your assets and on the right hand side you have um, actions things you can do with your wallet so we're beginning the process of adding um, those actions onto the right hand side so things like you know uh, market performance for that particular asset and you know um, uh, what's it called um, card summaries to show you know if you're supplying it what it's currently yielding and what it has yielded these kinds of things are being added uh, now and over the next couple of weeks so that the the actual app itself will start to fill out because um, right now it's a bit bare on the right hand side because we've been focusing on um, the core functionality in addition to that um, <clears throat> we're doing a lot of heavy work on the support in the wallet for various different blockchains so to be able to handle um, ERC20 tokens, be able to do ETH, be able to do Bitcoin, um, so that it so that it functions as sort of a fully featured uh, fully featured wallet. So what I can say is right now the launch date um, for the wallet um, is set for the beginning of May. So we'll be able to um, come out of testnet um, in the beginning of May. We have our Cardano Auditor lined up, which is Vacuum Labs. We have our um, uh, EVM Auditor lined up, which is Certec. Um, all of them have been set up. We have the agreements in place. Timing is all sort of lined up, um, and we'll be able to push that out. So what we're doing in regards to the auditing on, on the Certec side is the token audit and the wallet audit. Um, and on the on the Cardano side, it's the wallet audit and the um, lending and borrowing protocol audit. There we go. So yeah, we've got our ducks in a row and things seem to be coming together. So it's a good time. Uh, anything else we know we want to cover or do we want to get to um, uh, C2F, crypto to fiat? No, we can go on to EMI now, that's fine. Okay. So I think the, the previous the, the user's question was about the EMI license, but I think there's more we can talk about than just the EMI broadly. Yeah, so <clears throat> in regards to progress around that, um, we have a technology stack in place now. We're about a month, um, a month through the development cycle for the modification of the technology stack. Um, we're about that same place for the um, uh, development of the mobile applications for Android and iOS. Um, where, so we will definitely be launching uh, an Android, native Android application. We're not 100% sure yet whether we're going to be launching a native iOS version. Um, the reasoning for that is that we saw that just last week, um, Uniswap's app in the Apple App Store uh, was banned for a year. So looking at the general hostility of Apple towards anything related to crypto, and in particular related to NFTs, we don't know if it's a very um, prudent for us to go through the sort of go through the paces to build a full featured um, iOS app um with a very very tiny chance of it ever being approved by uh by apple to be able to do anything uh we haven't decided on this yet but this is kind of still under under discussion and we'll probably make a decision um in the next two weeks as to whether we continue with the ios app or whether we go to a um progressive web app like a full featured uh almost native progressive web app that you can install on your phone and it will work maybe like 80 to 90 percent as good um, as your native iOS app. <clears throat> For the um, other parts of it, the licensing parts of it, um, we're still working with the regulators. We're still going through the details of, you know, compliance policies and procedures, KYC and AML. Um, we have a new law firm based in Lithuania. Who's taking care of a lot of taking care of a lot of this? We have a full time um, compliance officer now working on it. So um, it's a lot of you know. I'd love to say that there's a lot of really sexy things going on on the on the EMI side, but 
you know, it's just a bunch of really, really boring stuff right now. Um, we have the contracts in place for um, fiat to crypto um, transactions. Um, and now we're in the process of starting to approach um, businesses um, as pilot customers. So I expect that in, what is it, May, we'll start onboarding our first um, bank, uh, private and business private customers or private customers and business customers. Um, the goal is to onboard a handful of people. I don't know exactly how many, probably maybe a uh, hundred uh, private people and 20 businesses. Um, so if anybody here is interested in applying um, to be one of those early, early uh, participants, you're more than welcome. We'll probably have a sign up um, in the next couple of weeks for doing that. Uh, the criteria for it has largely to do with where you're located. So we want to have um, private and business customers that really kind of cover the globe, cover lots of different countries, um, so that we can look at all of the policies and procedures and regulations and how money flows happen and things like that um, across the globe, so that we're not just focused on a very small area of uh, geographic area. And then if we launch the the bank, then, you know, we run into problems in other geographic areas. Um, so that's kind of the, the high level. I would say that from a, from a resource perspective, um, we're probably about 70% blockchain and maybe 30 or 35% uh, banking technology. Um, so we're focused much more on the on the crypto side, but a lot of that has largely to do with the fact that you know the banking stack that we're getting for for the back end for the EMI, um, it's an existing banking stack. We're buying it and modifying it as opposed to building it from scratch, and most of the crypto stuff we're building from scratch. There you go. Um, we're running up on the uh, one hour mark here, so that was pretty good comprehensive overview of like where we're at with the banking side of things. Uh, I think we, it's about this time we should probably switch it to the actual AMA part. So we've given the, like a lot of the information just so we don't end up like you know double counting uh, in terms of questions or whatnot. So we've given out like the most pertinent information. If there's anything else that um, we haven't covered here that people are interested in? We're going to open this up now to the AMA portion for the next like thirty ish minutes. So if anybody here. Has a question or is on the Discord and wants to ping me there in the AMA questions, uh, feel free to do so. Um, so we've got a few of them. We already asked, uh, drew the one from the EMI. Matt Bowman is here. Um, how do you become a MailChain validation node operator? So, yeah, so <clears throat> the validators um, for the Mel blockchain are effectively avalanche validators. So the way that it works is that it, when it comes to the consensus mechanism on Avalanche, um, it's a separate blockchain entirely that operates the, the validation side of it. Um, and then what Avalanche has done is they have their own EVM blockchain, uh, which is a different parallel blockchain that handles all the EVM smart contracts and EVM tokens, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so MELD is another one of these EVM blockchains. It's just we've defined our own set of uh, monetary policies and tokenomics and things like that. Uh, but we share the consensus mechanism. And so the reason why this is relevant is that obviously the Avalanche consensus mechanism has been going on for a very long time. There are you know thousands of validators. It's been battle tested under very, very high, high, uh, high volume and congestion. And it's proven that it works really well. So to become a validator, you need to first become an avalanche validator. And so the way you become an avalanche validator is you have to, just like on Cardano, you have to have a pledge. And the pledge is 2,000 AVAX. And then once you have that pledge and you become a, a, an avalanche validator, then you are able to become a meld validator. That said, we are, I know because 2,000 AVAX is a lot right? It's a lot of money. Um, we are also talking to some um, sort of staking service providers about working with them 
to be able to spin up a meld validator node and allow people to participate in it um, without having to put up those 2000 AVAX. Like a cross so, Kind of, kind of. Uh, basically, it's uh, meld will supply the 2000 AVAX and then they have a technology that takes that node and then segments it into pieces. Um, so you can still earn the, the yield on it. You can earn the block rewards, um, but you don't have to go through the process. You, you don't have to put up, you know, the same amount of meld or you don't have to put up the same amount of AVAX or something like that. So we're talking to a couple of providers right now. They're interested, but we need to be able to prove that we're going to have a lot of customers. So it's an ongoing discussion. Uh, we'll probably have some sort of answer and finalization about this by uh, the time we launch in May. Um, and we'll be able to sort of share more details with you. Um, <coughs> the, the, the system right <coughs> sorry, the blockchain right now, we have three validators. When we launch, we have to have a minimum of, of nine. Um, but we're, we're very open to working with literally anybody and everybody um, who wants to be a validator. We'll do everything that we can. We'll bend over backwards to help the community be able to get into this um, ecosystem without having to put up the 2000 AVAX. Um, but I don't know the details about how that's going to work yet. It's still in process. Awesome. Um, we've got another fellow who buckshotted a whole ton of questions, so I may only take a few and go back to them if uh, we're short from other people. Uh, let's see. And someone, Mr. Haskell, if you're asking in the wrong channel, you need to ask in the um, in the Twitter space questions. I can sort of see the notifications, but you're asking in the wrong part of the Discord. So you'll have to put those back in Twitter space for me to see them. Because um, managing these two apps, I don't want to try and bounce around too much between channels. Um, okay. Number one, user protocol rewards are earned in meld brackets for lending and borrowing. A, tracking the is the tracking the earned meld through on-chain analysis, displaying the earned user earned rewards in the app, and ability for user to redeem claim meld protocol rewards. So, in general, I think he's just asking about protocol reward functionality. So I had to sort of like assemble those all in together. Protocol award what rewards for lending and borrowing. Rewards as in the same concept that Aave has, like, you know, basically you know, paying out rewards to get to use the, the blockchain or to use the protocol. Is that what we're thinking about? Yeah, he, he's saying rewards, but I don't think he's being very specific about what kind. So Merlin, you might have to, you might have to. Okay, so, yeah. I, can, so I can talk a little bit about that For, with regards yeah. to yield. When you mm -hmm. supply an asset, um, unless you're using the, the, the genius loan, when you supply an asset, then you generate a yield on that asset. And so let's say you supply um, 1,000 ADA, then the yield you get back will be an ADA, and it will just start to accumulate in that pool that you've supplied in, right? So let's say you get a 3% yield or a 4% yield on that ADA, then you're just going to get that ADA paid out into the into the pool that you've supplied already, um, and so you you'll just get this compounding of interest, right? So your the 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 principal will increase, and therefore the the amount of yield you're going to get is it going to increase? Um, so on the borrow side, when you supply when you borrow, let's say you borrow a hundred dollars, um, and you pay whatever two percent or three percent interest on that then the interest that you're paying, you're not actually paying. What happens is, if let's say, just for, for simplicity, like, let's say it's 1%. What that means is that if you put $100 in, then in a year, the amount that you have borrowed is no longer $100. It's $101. So you never have to actually pay the interest back, per se, um, the debt that you have created just increases. And so the, the, the way that the genius yield works, or the, sorry, not genius yield, <laughs> the way that the genius loan works is that on the supply side, when you're paid an interest, then that interest 
goes onto the onto the debt side to pay down the debt. Um, under a normal set of circumstances, it just stays in the supply side, and then on the borrowed side, it just keeps on building up and and getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So I hope that that kind of answered. But we do not have any like <clears throat> specialized rewards like. Um, like Ave has, you know, like if you sort of go and supply, then you not only earn your yield, but you earn a bunch of Ave tokens. Uh, we don't have anything like that, at least not as of right now. Okay. He's got a few questions, but I'll, I'll come back to him later if, uh, you know, if we don't get more from other people. We've got a bunch lined up from others. Um, Little wants to ask, uh, I guess it's in terms of the bank manager NFTs, why are only ISPO participants eligible? Wouldn't it be more fun to have an option for diamond hand holders to mint one as well? Hang on a minute. Wait, wait a second. <laughs> By definition, if you're a diamond hand holder, unless you bought it in the after, sort of in the in the aftermarket or the secondary market, if you're yeah. a diamond hand holder, then you are an ISPO participant, participant. <laughs> right? So if you bought it, sort of, you know, in a different part of the market, or sorry, sorry, in the secondary market, and like whatever, you know, JPEG store or something, um, which. I'm one of those people. So I did not participate in the ISPO in the very beginning. I participated much later. Um, but then, yeah, you, you're, you're not eligible. The, the, the whole point of the bank manager was to have a kind of a general reward for everybody that participated in the ISPO, um, not specifically to, uh, to Diamond Hands holders per se, but to uh, the diamond hands participants that actually were there, um, you know, and this, this comes down to the basic principle of, you know, we want to, we don't want to forget where we came from, right? We, we started with an ISPO. We launched with an ISPO and we have to be very grateful to those people that participated in the ISPO. Um, and we're not sort of, we're not stepping away from that, gratitude and that's the important thing to keep in mind and given how many like um bank managers will be available or eligible to mint it stands to reason that there will be plenty available on the secondary market for easy to obtain prices right these are more geared towards the people you know you making use of their utility right for the protocol and doing more sophisticated functions where you, you between the relationship between nfts and a, an existing protocol right so the point isn't really to make this rarefied collection. You know, we want people to have really cool, awesome looking artwork and assets, but we want a lot of people to be able to use them, right? So it's not one of those things where you're trying to really constrain supply just to make the price go up. Now, if anybody else wants to speculate on them, that's their prerogative, right? But that's not the driving force behind why they exist, right? Now, if Meld becomes extremely popular and the utility of these NFTs goes up with them, then sure, hey, you know, that would be cool too. But that's not the driving force behind these. So I think if you want to hold these things long term and you and you really like what they're about, uh, it stands to reason that they should be able to be bought on the secondary market, given the amount of number of them for a not brutal price. Let's put it that way, right? So fairly competitive price, if I had to guess, because a lot of people are essentially getting these, you know, for having already participated. So they're not paying anything else right now. For getting them when they go to mint other than the minting cost which will be pretty much covering costs maybe a little bit extra for the partners so it's gonna be dirt cheap to mint them right so it's not really a barrier um so getting on to the next question uh what oracles are you planning to use any preference and why i think we kind of covered this before but <clears throat> oracles are, st are still a serious um challenge on cardano um when we get a bit farther down the road um with our optimization and our sort of testing, load testing, et cetera, um, I'll be able to give you a much more detailed definition or description of what it is and how it is we're setting up oracles. Um, but I can tell you that it's it's arguably one of the most problematic parts of Cardano right now. It's just, it's a, it's not there yet. It's still, still very, very early days when it comes to oracles. Um, <clears throat> at least oracles in the context that we're, we're used to thinking of them as on, on, on the EVM side of things. Um, 
having a sort of single purpose private oracle is not very hard but having a decentralized oracle um that can kind of uh is kind of man in the middle resistant is ddos resistant um that we're not there yet when it comes to uh, those that type of technology on cardano all right and the next question is for luke biano a lot of constant strain string together here um update on the gold back token update on the five uh, kilos of gold bought and being moved to meld vaults yeah so um the smart contracts for that are going to be audited in the same batch of audits that we do with uh with certec and with uh, vacuum labs um we're finalizing some of the licensing components to be able to hold gold um i think you'll see a lot more details in relationship to the gold token and the process and you know what is what is in store for us in the uh in the version of the white paper that we're soon to get soon to release so version 1.9 of the white paper will include a lot of details around the gold backed stable uh the gold backed reserve currency um and how that fits into the bigger ecosystem and how it relates to the meld token and how it relates to the bank etc um so it's on track um it's not a priority right now our priority is laser focused our priority is to finalize uh the lending and borrowing protocol on cardano and to launch the meld app there we go um try and parse through a bit of the grammar here will we be able to stay meld uh on the validator nodes and give rewards like we do on cardano are we going to have lace wallets yeah. pairs that would be perfect for cross chain wallets hell yeah so for that's stake. a prerequisite you have yeah. to be able to stay you have to be able to delegate to the to the node and earn that's a prerequisite absolutely cool. uh, anything about lace wallet excuse me lace wallet the iog uh, developed wallet <clears throat> anything about lace wallet um I can't tell you much about Lace Wallet. I haven't done much with it. All I can tell you is that um, in our performance testing, in our kind of, you know, uh, like different attack vectors and, and different ways of, of trying to, to, um, to do bad things on the, on the Cardano blockchain, the Lace Wallet has proved to be super resilient. It's proved to be infinitely more performant than any other wallet that we've seen so far. That's um, good by like a factor of, you know, 10. Um, so I don't know much about the wallet other than the fact that it's, it's pretty, pretty sharp code, code wise or technology wise is pretty, pretty sharp. Um, but I can't tell you much beyond that right now. The, with regards to wallet support, we're looking at first NAMI, um, and then Giro and Eternal, and we're looking at support for um, what's it called, MetaMask, and Core. So those are the the sort of um, browser extension wallets that we're uh, focusing on supporting uh, in the Meld Wallet or in the Meld App. Awesome. Um, another question from Morgan, but it is a question that's already been we touched on. This is about the genius of self repaying loan. Um, this space is recorded, Demogren, so you'll be able to touch on that. We probably covered it about, like, I want to say 25, 30 minutes into the space, roughly, when we talked about the Genius Loan, maybe 20 minutes in. So we covered that for a little bit, so we're just going to skip on that, and you can just check what Ken said in the recording. They're up for 30 days on Twitter, but we backed them all up on YouTube, so you will be able to find this on our YouTube channel eventually. Um, Lord is asking, uh, and someone else, Killer Daft Punk, who's asking about the thing. You have to ask these all these questions. So those of you asking questions on Discord, there's a channel tw literally called Twitter dash space dash questions. You have to ask them all there. Otherwise, uh, they're not going to get answered. Uh, so just copy and paste it if you put in some other channel into that one called Twitter space questions. Lord, um, long time user. Hello, Lord, uh, uh, inhabitant of our Discord. Uh, don't know if this was already covered, but is Mel plan on showing up to any of the conventions this year? If so, what will they be showing up? So, in general, um, we're not going to any conventions um, until we've launched our products. So, this is not about sort of marketing, you know, vaporware. This is about the whole organization focusing on um, 
what we're supposed to be focusing on, which is building product. So uh, after May, the launch of the wallet, and then June, July, the launch of the bank, uh, then we will probably be much more sort of out there in the world and going to conferences and participating and talking and demoing and all that kind of stuff. Until then, it's very, very minimal. So we're going to have one person at consensus. Um, we're going to have one person um, in Dubai next week for a couple of conferences just for two days. Um, those are the only plans that we have at this moment in time. Uh, yeah, we're not, to, it's, not, it's not a focus. The focus is to build product, build product. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just trying to go on, without like having something to demo. It's just sort of you can talk about as much as you want, but it's way it really helps you know lock in the experience when you actually have someone to be able to test drive something, right? So timing is everything. Uh, another user is asking ALN, uh, according to published information on tokenomics, there's a mobile platform incentives. Uh, when there will be no incentives for usage of protocol similar to Aave Compound, what are those MELS tokens used for then? I think we just covered this in terms of like, Finding and borrowing rewards, and also taking the note on the subnet. So, so there's that. It'll be used in the on the banking side. Um, mm -hmm. <clears throat> we might <clears throat> we might have some um, different types of staking opportunities. Uh, we need to look at that in more detail. Um, I can say that uh, for sort of what I guess you could call version two. On our roadmap, um, sometime in early uh, in 2024, um, there will be more significant staking opportunities for the Mel token. But beyond governance, you know, paying gas fees, uh, delegating to stake pools, and getting block rewards um, and usage on the banking side. Um, there isn't a lot of additional, well, obviously, and, and, uh, and for the insurance pools, um, that's a big one, I guess. Uh, we don't have other uh, staking opportunities or, or other uses for the MELD token. So I'm just navigating back to another channel here, um, giving out XP to people who are helping move the process along. Thank you, Little, for... Um, replying to people and directing them to the right channel. Much appreciated. Um, let's see. On the Killer Daft Punk, on the Meld website, the roadmap go, only goes until quarter two. Is there a plan to update the roadmap and what does the future look like? Um, there is a plan to update the roadmap, but <clears throat> we probably won't update it until the end of the year. Um, that's because we have uh, on the sort of drawing board we have a, like a, a very radical new piece of technology um, that we have to prototype. Um, and once we've prototyped it and we've proven that it will actually do what we think it's going to do, um, then we'll write a white paper on it and we'll put it into the roadmap. Um, but right now it's far too early for us to uh, put this, this kind of theoretical tech um, into a white paper or something or into a roadmap. Also, it has a lot to do with the organization. Um, we don't want to have the organization focus on focusing on anything, you know, in a year and a half or a, yeah, in a year and a half. Um, we want people to be focusing on what we're delivering this year, what we're delivering the wallet, the bank, the lending and borrowing protocol. This is this is everything. This is our focus. Cool, uh, Bob Musha. I'm um, asking two questions, or I think the well, first two sort of revolve around the EMI, which we touched upon about 20, 25 minutes ago. It was like the very first question we asked. So um, the recording will deal with that. Um, his third question, moving forward with the MELD app and the MELD sidechain, what will be the role, to, role of the MELD sidechain? Is it solely about converting tokens to be an interface between the MELD app and other chains? Or is the MELD app going to be running on the MELD sidechain? The MELD app will run on the, on the MELD sidechain in the same way that it runs on you know other blockchains or runs with other blockchains the big difference is we will have the meld protocol uh the lending and borrowing protocol will run natively on cardano and the meld protocol will run natively on the meld blockchain that's the primary difference we won't at least at this point in time we won't have the lending and borrowing protocol running natively on 
Polygon or Ethereum or Avalanche or any of the other chains. It'll only be running natively on the Mel blockchain. And Cardano, sorry. Cool. Um, I think some of the other stuff right now is just more so just commentary. Um, appreciate it. Uh, one guy's criticizing my response to the EMI thing. Okay, maybe we can do a clarification here. Um, EMI license was announced for Q1 2023. What happened? Obstacles, timelines? No, I mean, it's, it's exactly what I what I said yeah, before. Yeah, EMI so, license, we announced like the, a movement in, in, what was it, in the end of December, but I don't think yeah. we said Q, necessarily Q1 2023. Because so, like that, no, it's fine. Basically, we, we, have, yeah. we have the EMI license. That's no problem. But yeah. the point is that you know, the the work around that, it's, it's, around it's it. a it's a banking license, right? Yeah. And so therefore, the a lot of the driving factors around this, you have things like you know, ISO 20, 20, 2701, You have SOC two. You have PCI regulations. You have all kinds of regulations and requirements around KYC and AML and you know, transaction monitoring and all of these kinds of things. This is the exciting life that we live in right now when it comes to the EMI. We're doing all of these policies and procedures and documentation and getting the compliance up and running and working and making sure that these documents are all available and they're versioned and they're sort of deployed into the organization and that everybody can sort of use them. And, you know, it's it's a lot of incredibly boring things that we're working on on the EMI side, um, on the actual EMI itself. Um, outside of that, we're still negotiating pricing and terms for things like, you know, debit card provider and transactions. Um, we're building the, the banking stack. So the banking, the, the team building or sort of modifying the banking stack are working very closely um, with the sort of EMI participants or the EMI EMI staff uh, to be able to get that all up and running and work correctly um, and making sure that everything sort of meets the, the regulators requirements. Um, but it's, <clears throat> there's nothing exciting to talk about. It's all a lot of regulatory um, requirements, a lot of lawyers, that kind of thing. Nothing exciting, unfortunately. All right, and then just his follow up there was actually like, what what kind of shape does the on and on or off ramp solution take? So, <clears throat> in the same way uh, that we're treating bridging, um, the goal will be to make this on and off ramp utterly smooth. It'll be buttery, really, really smooth and simple and straightforward. No complexity to it whatsoever. Um, so. Generally, um, being able to you know go between let's say Bitcoin and dollars, it'll just be as simple as going to like a, a Uniswap or something and just picking um, Bitcoin and picking dollars, seeing your quote contract, hitting yes, and then the dollars are in your bank account. Um, we're also looking at other um, mechanics related to that. So, for example, with regards to lending and borrowing, um, when you if you borrow or if you if you supply an asset and you're going to to borrow fiat, then it's as simple as supplying the asset, and then on the borrow side, you select dollars, and when you select dollars, then when you borrow it, it just appears in your bank account. There is no other. There's nothing else involved in the process. Um, we're also looking at doing the opposite of that, um, where if people have dollars and they want to stake those dollars, quote unquote, stake the dollars on the crypto side, then we'll have a very fluid transaction from dollars straight into crypto, straight into a crypto stake pool and start earning yield. Um, and when the customer wants to withdraw or they want to unstake, then it will just automatically unstake and go straight back into the fiat account. There we go. Hopefully that answers your questions, uh, Bob Musha. Uh, good for the clarification. Sorry, there's like a theme part of a lot of stuff, so I had to try and move through it. Like large amounts of text are difficult to parse through when I'm trying 
when I'm trying to handle all these questions. So um, that's what we got generally for now. Is anybody has any questions would like to use the actual request to speak function here um, on the space? Otherwise, we can wrap it up. Does anybody have any questions like to use the request to speak? Anybody like to come up to the stage? Let's maybe take another question in the Twitter space question. So I don't see anybody typing anything. Uh, yeah. So then I guess the, we just put like our sort of validatory remarks there. Oh, we've got one request. Uh, that is from, uh, it doesn't even show. It just says, oh, Jake, you give Jacob. There we go. One, one. Okay. There we go. So you wait for the session change to switch over. Jacob. I can. Um, just wanted to check: Is the plan still to launch in uh, all the countries that initially were targeted? I think it was like over 100 countries. Or uh, is there any different uh, legislations that you guys want to? Well, ne we'll need to follow now. Sorry, one more time. I didn't hear the beginning of your question. Is the plan still to launch in uh, all the countries you initially targeted? Or uh, yes, it is. Nothing has changed. This is one of the reasons why we are bringing. You know this you know, 100 users and, you know, 20 or 30 businesses on board early um, is to go through the, the onboarding process with them to make sure everything is smooth uh, for all of these different countries. And we make sure that we've sort of, every country has a little bit of a difference in regards to how they handle their, you know, regulations. Uh, so we need to make sure that we've, we've gone through that process and we've made the process as predictable as possible. And so, no, the number of countries we're supporting um, has not changed at all. Hello? Hello. Awesome. Thank you. That's, uh, yeah. that's reassuring. Thank you. Sure. I'll check for questions once again. Um, uh, so, yeah, um, I think that's just about everything. Nothing really else is coming in on Discord and things a bit for requests on Twitter. So. I think we could put it there. Ken, do you have any um, parting remarks for all our guests? I mean, just, uh, you know, I'm on Telegram on a regular basis. Um, so if anybody has any additional questions, you're more than welcome to put them into the Telegram general group, or you can just send them to me in Telegram, um, and I'll try and answer them. Um, don't, uh, don't be upset if I didn't see your message, because I get so many messages per day, it might end up sort of going below the fold. Um, but I do check the, the melt global. Yeah. Pretty much constantly all day long. There we go. All right, everybody. Thanks Thank everybody you guys very much. Yeah. I really appreciate it. Um, I know this is a long time coming, uh, but you know, it's going well and we're going to see a lot more results and a lot more really interesting and exciting stuff over the coming two months. How's your ankle? My ankle sucks, man. Really sucks. Can't go anywhere. Can't do anything. So uh, it is what it is. Can't do much about it. All right. Then. Well, get better. Thanks. I'm fine. Just stuck. All right. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Take care. Yeah. We'll see you next Have week. a nice day, everybody. Bye.